Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number five in this Bible study series that we are calling Better Together. This is a topical study. We are all over the scripture from one week to the next rather than going through a specific book. And uh, we are in lesson number five this week. Uh, you're going to need your Bibles today open to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 12. You also want the listening guide. There's a listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it the same place you found this video. Just scroll down and click on that link. Download that PDF and print it out. There are some blanks you can fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson. But much more importantly than that, there are some discussion questions there for you and your small group to go through together after the teaching portion. I hope that you're taking advantage of that critical part of the transformation or spiritual change process in each of us. That's where that happens. So before we jump into the lesson today, let's pray, shall we? Our hearts are open to you, Father, because we want to be better. We want to be more like Jesus in every way possible. Each of us recognize that we all have a long way to go. And we all have a great deal of change that will have to happen in us in order for that to take place. And yet you are good and you are faithful to continue to shape us and to mold us through the power of your word, through the power of friendships, our prayer then, Father, is that even today, even today, as we open your word, that you will open our hearts and that you'll change how we understand who you are, that you'll change how we see ourselves and how we see those around us, how we see our world. Our prayer is that by changing how we see these things, you'll change who we are at, at, at a core level. You'll change our identity to be more and more lined up with our identity in Christ. That's our prayer, Father. Will you do that even today? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Better Together. This is a study of our life in community together as Christ followers and how we are better individually and how we are better corporately when we are together and how that, how that actually works in our lives. Uh, we've, we've started this unit looking at uh, metaphors from the Apostle Paul about togetherness, uh, one being the body of Christ, another one being family. We also uh, talked uh, last week, uh, or actually the week after the third week, we talked about the, the, um, the authority of Scripture and the place of Scripture in our lives and how critical that is. Last week, we looked at the birth of the New Testament church, this revolution that you and I are a part of, uh, the togetherness is all a part of a bigger revolution that was birthed in Acts chapter 2, and we looked at, at that community and how community togetherness looked for them. Uh, this week we're going to be looking at uh, the topic of generosity, that is uh, a, a, a heart attitude towards one another and towards helping one another. It, it has Yes, it has something to do with with finances and with giving, but it really, uh, as you're gonna see in today's lesson, it has a great deal more to do with just our overarching attitude and our heart attitude towards one another and towards meeting each other's needs. That's where Paul is going to take us. We're gonna be looking at his second letter to the church in Corinth. And so you're gonna need your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians chapter nine or your Bible app open to 2 Corinthians chapter nine, which is actually a continuation of a message that Paul begins in his letter in chapter 8. Uh, in, in chapter 8, he's talking to the believers in Corinth. He's, he's preparing to make a trip to Corinth. He's, he's preparing to return to Corinth after having been in Corinth about a year before this. He's now planning to come back through Corinth on his way back to Jerusalem. And what he's doing is he's riding ahead to them and saying, on my trip back, to Jerusalem, I am taking up a collection for those believers in Jerusalem, and I want you to be prepared for when I get there to be able to give to that collection. So that's the conversation that he begins in chapter 8. He tells them, you were among the very first uh, followers of Jesus to want to give to this cause. This was You are the ones who helped me come up with this idea. And so because you were some of the very first who wanted to give to this cause, you have now inspired others to do so as well. And so now we have this big collection that uh, that is going on for the people back in Jerusalem. So he's giving them a heads up. Uh, and he's, he let them know in chapter 8 
just in case they were interested, that the very poor, very poverty-stricken church in Macedonia has already followed the Corinthians' lead and has given sacrificially way more than they could possibly have afforded to give. They've given sacrificially to this cause. He wanted them to know that and that they did it joyfully, that they did it willingly and joyfully, not not in, in a regretting way or a disgruntled way at all. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, listen to what he says. He says to the, to the Corinthian church, Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. You guys, have, you guys have knocked out of the park in so many ways. Let's continue knocking it out of the park in how you give. And he's going to, he, he, he basically saying, finish well, finish what you started last year. Listen to more of what he says in chapter 8, beginning in verse 11. He says, give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. That's such an important concept in today's lesson. And give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should, should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. So, so Paul is just kind of giving them a heads up. This is all in chapter 8, before our lesson today. You know, giving them a heads up that he's coming, that, that this, this uh, collection is going to be taken, and he's wanting them to begin praying now about how they will uh, respond to that, those collection efforts. He, he then takes a temporary detour in his letter to talk about Titus and his companions because Titus is the one that Paul is sending ahead of him to begin this collection effort. But then he comes back to this topic in chapter 9. Um, and what he says to them is, I'm sending Titus and others ahead of me in order to encourage you to be praying now about that gift. I want you to be praying about this so that it's ready when I arrive there. And so that is all kind of the ramp up into today's lesson, which begins in chapter 6. But let's go back one verse and just begin in chapter 5 because I believe it keeps it all in context. Um, excuse me, in verse 5 of chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse 5 says, So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready, but I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. And then we get into our passage for today, beginning in verse 6. The point is this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay, so I think it's important to stop here and recognize uh, it is important to Paul that their giving, whatever it is, whatever amount it is, is done with the right attitude. His message to them here is not about an amount. His message here to them is about an attitude behind that giving. Why is it given? Why it's given is actually more important to Paul than what is given or, or than the amount itself is given. Uh, they had apparently already expressed that their hearts were moved towards giving to this cause. They had already, they, they are the ones who helped Paul come up with this idea in the first place. So they had already expressed their heart in that regard the last time Paul was with them. So what he's saying to them now is he's just teaching them to seek the Spirit's movement in their own hearts, to, to, to get in touch with what the Spirit is doing and saying in their own hearts, and to then give accordingly. The, this, I think, is the key to understanding this entire passage, this entire lesson. This is the key to understanding it. He is, not, he is not trying to drum up an amount here. What he's trying to do is encourage them to seek their hearts and to be in touch with the Spirit and to give accordingly out of that. The why is so important, why we give. He's not wanting them to give out of any sense of guilt. He's not wanting them to give out of any sense of obligation. 
Um, rather, he's wanting them to give out of a sense of joy, out of a sense of excitement to be a part of what God is doing. And without that understanding, I think that we would read verse 6 entirely differently and read it in the entirely wrong way. Look at verse 6 again. Uh, it says, what whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. If, if we don't understand this context from the Apostle Paul that he's talking about the attitude and the heart and the why, then what we will read into verse 6 is very much a prosperity gospel kind of a mentality. It is this, uh, it, the more amount, the bigger amount I give, the bigger amount God will give back to me. And that's not what verse 6 is saying in terms of the amount of money or the amount of finances or the amount of resources I give. That's not what it's saying at all. What it's saying is the, the more joy that is behind my gift, the more excitement that is behind my gift for whatever the amount is, the more joy and excitement that's, bound, uh, that's behind it, God will take that and redeem it for His purposes and multiply that joy and that excitement back to me. And so that's the kind of sowing and reaping that verse 6 is talking about. Um, it, it, otherwise, it just reads as a financial investment. It reads as a return on the investment. And that's not, uh, the more money you give, the more God will give you in turn. That's not the sentiment here. I do not believe that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. What he's talking about here is how much joy and excitement there is. That's the investment. The investment is my joy and my excitement behind the gift. God will multiply that in His provision for us. It would seem that when the Spirit is involved in our giving, when we, when we let go of the world's way of doing things and when we allow the Spirit to motivate our giving, that's what it feels like. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first statement on your listening guide. When my sacrificial giving is led by the Spirit, it is neither from a place of guilt nor from a sense of obligation. Rather, it is from a heart filled with joy and excitement about joining God in important work. Now that becomes kind of the foundation to the entire rest of what Paul has to say here. So we've really got to understand that linchpin point that he's making here in order to best understand everything else that follows. Attitude, as it turns out, is shaped by our perspective, by how we see these things. That's what he goes into next in verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor His righteousness endures forever. What Paul is doing here is he's, he's writing in order to shape their mindset regarding their resources, to shape how they see those resources, to shape how they understand those. And, and truthfully, and, and there's been a lot of study uh, on this subject, both even, even within the secular word, the world, there's been a lot of study in this so subject sociologically about people's mindsets towards resources, there are two basic mindsets. There is a scarcity mindset and there is an abundance mindset. There is a mindset that comes from a place of scarcity that believes, that sees all resources as a pie that has to be divided among whoever's here. And so if you take a big piece out of this pie, that leaves less for everyone else. And so I am therefore resentful of the fact that you took such a big piece because that automatically means less for everyone else. That is what we call a scarcity mindset. And there are many people in our culture today that have a scarcity mindset. The, uh, the opposing mindset is what we would call an abundance mindset, which is the mindset Paul is encouraging them to have here, which is there is no limit here to the amount of resources that God can provide. That's part of being God. He is a, an abundant and an extravagant God, and He just has and has and has and gives and gives and gives. And the fact that one person gets a lot does not necessarily mean less for everyone else. That's not the way it works at all in God's economy. Uh, so it, 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 what, I've, what I've come to understand uh, it, with regard to these two mindsets is you can find both of these mindsets in every single demographic class of people. Within the people who are filthy, filthy rich, 
the billionaires of this world, you will find some of them who have a scarcity mindset and you will find others who have an abundance mindset. If, if you can even imagine having a scarcity mindset when you have so much money, but, but that's, that, that's absolutely the case. And by the same token, you can be dirt poor, you can be among the poorest of the poor in our culture. And I, I know, I've met people who have an abundance mindset even in the midst of that culture, and I've met people who have a scarcity mindset in that, in that, and everywhere in between. The point is this, this mindset is not dictated by what we have. This mindset is dictated rather by how we're reared and by the circumstances of, that, of, of, of our life experiences. And for Christ followers, this mindset is shaped very much by the Holy Spirit in our, in our hearts. And so it is in a correct understanding of God, as those of us who call ourselves Christ followers and are seeking after God, a correct understanding of God recognizes that He wants for us to have this abundance mindset because He Himself is extravagant and abundant. If you have your listening guide, uh, let's fill in the second statement on your listening guide. Developing a God-centered perspective of resources moves us more and more from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. He is a God of extravagance and abundance. Uh, the more I follow after God, the more I follow after Christ the more and more my mindset, mindset should be moving towards abundance, towards abundance. That's what Paul is saying in this passage. But then he actually doubles down on that idea in what he says next, beginning in verse 10. Look what it says. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Look at that metaphor, that farming or agricultural metaphor about the harvest of your righteousness. It is a farming metaphor that he's using here. God supplies the seed for the sower, but he also supplies the bread for the sower's table. But, but what he's talking about here is to increase the harvest of what, your seed and your bread? No, your righteousness. So he's using an agricultural metaphor to go back to make this exact same point again. He's talking about God's economy, not of seed and bread and, and material things, but God's economy of righteousness, of, 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 of being in right standing before the Lord, of, of being a person of integrity, of being a person of generosity and compassion of being a more Christ-like person, those qualities and characteristics, that economy, how those are developed. What he's saying to us is God provides the seed, right, for, for growing those things, which is the Holy Spirit, but then he also provides the bread, the fruit of those things. So God is doing the provision on both sides. He provides the generosity in our hearts to be more giving, but then he also uses that generosity to produce similar thanksgiving and generosity in others around us. What he's describing here is kind of a cycle of generosity that can only be maintained by the Spirit of God working through us, this cycle of generosity. He produces a little bit of generosity in me, and therefore I give, and he takes that generosity in me, and he spreads it into you who I've given to, and he makes it even more generosity in you who gives back, and there it develops this cycle of giving. Um, in that sense, then, we, all of us, are both recipients of God's generosity, but we are also vehicles of God's generosity at the same time. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third statement on your listening guide. It is how God's economy works. When we get it right, God's people are both the recipients of and the vehicles for His generosity and provision. It is a cycle that builds upon itself over time. And so part of being together, part of our being better together is the growing of this generosity in our hearts the growing of the joy and the excitement in our hearts behind sacrificial giving to one another. 
that just should be growing and expanding and deepening over time. That's what this cycle of generosity should look like. That's why we are better when we are together because that continues to operate in our hearts and our lives. So there's one other outcome of this kind of generosity and it's what he addresses in verse 12. Here's what it says. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So this cycle of generosity that we're talking about not only increases generosity in one another, but it also deepens and widens our gratitude and our thanksgiving to God. It actually creates in us an attitude of gratitude. And that, in turn, makes us better and better. It makes our lives better. An attitude of gratitude actually enriches our lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says it this way. He says, in ordinary life, we hardly realize that we receive a great deal more than we give. And that is the own is, and I'm sorry, and that it is only with gratitude that life becomes rich. So let me say that again. In ordinary life, we hardly realize that we receive a great deal more than we give and that it is only with gratitude that life becomes rich. Without the gratitude, we're not rich. We're just constantly wanting more and more. But with the gratitude is when we begin to rest in that richness and realize how, how well off we are. Now, it, gratitude also helps us shift our focus off of ourselves and on to other people. It makes us other focused. Uh, listen to what John Ortberg says about it. Gratitude liberates us from the prison of self-preoccupation. I love that. Gratitude is a vehicle that actually takes the attention off of me, my preoccupation with self, and puts it on other people. So therefore, our, only, our own generosity, our own generosity towards others actually moves them more and more towards this attitude of gratitude. Our generosity towards others makes them more generous, but also makes them more thank, thankful. And that thanksgiving, that gratitude enriches. That's where life becomes really rich. And by the way, that then happens back to me in turn. And so there is that cycle that cycle of generosity and, as we've just seen, thanksgiving. If you have your listening guide, fill in the last statement on your listening guide. God's generosity towards us should make us more thankful, which makes us better. In turn, our generosity towards others has a similar benefit in their lives. So being better together, the betterness is defined in this passage in terms of generosity, righteousness, and thankfulness. Uh, abounding uh, in, in abundance in our lives and then the spirit produces that generosity in us so what has Paul taught us here about better giving here's what our takeaways are number one the heart behind better giving is joy and excitement number two the mindset behind better giving is not scarcity but abundance God is a God of abundance Number three, as Christ followers, we are both recipients and vehicles of God's generosity. It is this cycle at work in our lives. And number four, generosity produces an attitude of gratitude in us. And that is where richness is genuinely found. I am loving these lessons about our lives together in community with one another. I hope that you are as well. We'll be right here next week where we've left off. We'll be picking up our next topic of what it means to be better together. In the meantime, I love you guys. I hope you have a blessed week. We'll see you next time.